ladies and gentlemen, from 84 to 89, I chaired the Pollution Advisory Committee at Friends of the Earth. At the time, I was a newly appointed consultant working in the NHS, and my field was dermatology, so I came to the nuclear debate by accident. I had no particular agenda, and I was not being paid anything by Friends of the Earth. In fact, I've never been paid anything for my uh, environmental activity. However, it was clear straight away that there were two major health issues permeating the nuclear debate. One was the observation that there were clusters of childhood leukaemia in the vicinity of the only two reprocessing facilities in the UK, that was Doomray and Sellafield. And the second issue was that the atomic bomb data from the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were showing cancer rates much higher than the international safety standards allowed. In other words, the number of cancers or deaths from a given dose of ionizing radiation needed to be two or three times higher than official estimates. Uh, in order to try and achieve some sort of consensus on this issue, I organized a conference at the Hammersmith Hospital on the biological effects of ionizing radiation, and I invited Sir Richard Southwood, seen here, to chair it. Uh, Sir Richard was professor of zoology at Oxford University, he chaired the Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution, which looked at lead in the environment, which is how we knew each other. And he also chaired the BSE inquiry. And in 88, uh, he was chair of, sorry, 1986, he was chair of the National Radiological Protection Board. He went on to become vice chancellor of Oxford University. He was a remarkable man. Uh, the great thing about Sir Richard was he did not have a closed mind. Anyway, the conference was a success. Uh, here I am in 86 with three greats of the radiobiological field. Uh, Professor Alice Stewart from the UK, who demonstrated the extreme sensitivity of the fetus, human fetus, to ionizing radiation. Uh, in the middle is Professor Ed Radford, who chaired the Beer 3 Committee in America. And on the right is, uh, sorry, on the right is Ed Radford, and in the middle is Carl Morgan, who in 1955 became the first president of the Health Physics Society and in fact was editor of the journal Health Physics from 1955 to 1977. Sadly, I'm the only one left alive from that photograph. However, Sir Richard and I edited and published the conference proceedings of being titled the book Radiation and Health, the Biological Effects of Low-Level Exposure to Ionizing Radiation. Sir Richard and subsequently the NRPB accepted the implications of the new atomic bomb data and radiation standards were tightened not only in the UK but worldwide. Coincidentally, this made life much more difficult for the nuclear industry. It meant that allowable annual exposures for nuclear workers went down, and so costs went up. The CEGB had a plan to build 32 <coughs> nuclear reactors in the 1980s. In the event, only one was built. The second issue, that of the leukaemia clusters, remains unresolved. I don't want to go into the debate today as it's very complicated, but there is a lack of data supporting a dose response effect. Clusters of childhood leukemia have now been noted around other nuclear facilities where nuclear discharges are much lower, and they've also been noted around non-nuclear power stations. This has led to the Kindlin hypothesis whereby populations of workers who migrate to a new location to build power stations intermix viruses, one of which may be leukemogenic. Certainly we know that HTLV1 is a leukemogenic virus, but that is not prevalent in the UK. No one has identified what the particular virus might be around nuclear power stations, but it is generally accepted amongst most workers in the field that this is the best explanation that we have at the present time. Or, if it is not a single virus, then it is an abnormal response, immune response, to one or more common infections, viral or bacterial, in susceptible individuals. Mel Greaves is the world expert in this area. So what are the outstanding health issues today? Well, they relate to nuclear accidents and how many people will develop cancer and die as a result of a nuclear accident. The nuclear industry claims a major accident rate of one every million operating years. The reality is somewhat more sobering. If one looks at just civil nuclear reactors, we've had four accidents. Wind scale, now renamed Sellafield in 56, Three Mile Island in 79, Chernobyl in 86, and Fukushima in 2011. Four accidents, one of which could have wiped out New York and one of which could have wiped out Tokyo. Not exactly backward countries with antiquated technology. 
The nuclear industry has about 400 reactors worldwide with approximately 15,000 years of operating experience. So we're looking at an accident rate closer to one every 4,000 years, not one every million years, which means that with 400 reactors worldwide, we can expect a major accident every decade. If we build another 400 nuclear reactors, and I'm sure that E.ON would love to do that, um, oh, it was it EDF, can't remember, um, then we can expect a major accident every five years. Now, some countries may be willing to sustain this level of risk. I'm not sure it's a good idea in Great Britain, a small island with a very dense population. The consequences of a major accident in the UK don't really bear thinking about, which, of course, is why the fast breeder reactor was built in Dune Ray on the northern tip of Scotland, as far away from a large population centre as it is possible to get and still be on the UK mainland. The second aspect of nuclear activity that we need to consider is this. What is the real cancer risk from exposure to ionising radiation? I've already mentioned that the atomic bomb survivor data has led to the tightening of radiation standards within the nuclear industry. However, the majority of those who died at Hiroshima and Nagasaki were burnt alive. 15 to 20 percent died from acute radiation sickness, and long-term follow-up of the atomic bomb survivors showed that out of the 9,335 cancer deaths in a population of 86,000, 5 percent of the solid cancers were due to ionizing radiation and a third of the leukemias. More importantly, there are no inherited defects detectable amongst subsequent generation. I mean, this is the best experiment we've done as to the effects of ionizing radiation, um, and it does show that radiation does not seem to cause defects in subsequent generations. What about Chernobyl? This picture is the first picture to be taken of the reactor. It was taken seven hours after the explosion from a helicopter. It's fuzzy because of the very high radiation levels. The people who flew the helicopters over the reactor in order to drop lead to contain the accident received lethal doses of radiation. I'm not sure that in the future people will be so willing to do that. Um, the only proven radiobiological effect from the releases of, from Chernobyl, apart from the immediate deaths, has been an increase in thyroid cancer in those who were children at the time of the accident. The increase is rapid, it's still measurable today, though the level of thyroid cancer in those born after 1987 is now back to normal as radioactive iodine disappeared from the environment. Thyroid cancer is very amenable to treatment and only about 1% eventually die of their disease. Of approximately 6,000 cases of thyroid cancer diagnosed since Chernobyl in 86, only 15 have proved fatal. The figure might have been lower were it not for the fact that the population around Chernobyl was relatively iodine depleted and measures to limit the exposure of the surrounding population were not put into place rapidly. What about Fukushima? Releases of radiation from Fukushima were very much lower than those that were emitted from Chernobyl. In the case of cesium, approximately 25%. Furthermore, the Japanese government took measures more rapidly to limit the exposure of the surrounding population who were relatively iodine replete. Because of the experience at Chernobyl, the Japanese have launched an extensive monitoring program to screen the 360,000 children who were exposed to radioiodine and to follow them with regular checks every two years until the age of 20 and every five years thereafter. It is quite possible that no significant increase in thyroid cancer will be detected. So why do people worry so much exposure to ionizing radiation after a nuclear accident? Well, the first problem is the perception of dangers that you cannot measure. <clears throat> when a large population is exposed to a very small dose of radiation, it is assumed, using the no-threshold linear model of ionizing radiation, that that produces the same effect in terms of cancers as a small number of people being exposed to a very high level of radiation. Now, whether this is true or not, it's very difficult to know. No one can prove it. But if you multiply a large population, like the European population, and a small dose of radiation, just as c came from Chernobyl, then you come up with a figure of five to 10,000 people dying as a result of the Chernobyl nuclear accident. You cannot actually identify who those people are, but it has to be assumed that somewhere in the European population, people died from cancer as a result of Chernobyl that otherwise would not have died. So that is the first concern, this unseen danger. 
The second concern is more pertinent. How close were those accidents to a complete meltdown? In the case of Three Mile Island and in the case of Fukushima, it was touch as go as to whether New York or Tokyo were wiped out. At Fukushima, were it not for the heroism of the Japanese workers who went back into the plant and kept the water supply going to cool the reactor, there'd have been a major explosion and much of the island of Japan would have been contaminated, including the capital, Tokyo, which is not that far from Fukushima. In March, this um, aerial photograph was taken by a small unmanned drone and released by the Air Photo Service on March 24, 2011. Shows the damage unit three on the left. So this is the issues that we need to discuss when we're talking about building a new generation of nuclear plant in the UK. There's one other thing that needs to be considered about building nuclear power stations. They need cooling, so they have to be built on a river or by the sea. As climate change worsens, rivers will dry up and plants will become redundant. This has already happened in France, where three nuclear power stations on the Loire were put out of commission in 2009 due to the drought. Secondly, plants by the sea are built on or near the beach. Witness Fukushima. So what happens when sea levels rise? They will either become unusable or more worrying, downright dangerous. So I'm not convinced that nuclear power is the answer to Britain's energy needs. It may be a good solution in other countries, but not in this country. Thank you very much.